A very good afternoon to all of you. And my heartiest thanks to the organizing team, organizing secretary, Dr. Bharat Sabu, my scientific chair, and the entire team of Diabetes India for inviting me to this platform. And uh, my heartiest thanks to my co-speaker, Dr. Manohar, for accepting to speak as my debater for the topic. And the topic is very interesting. Should we move beyond metformin as a first-line therapy? So do you find some error in this statement, grammatically? A simple grammar. Should we go? So there should have been a question mark. There is no question mark. There is a exclamation mark. So this statement needs rewriting. Let's rewrite it. So when we rewrite it, we should move beyond metformin as a first-line therapy. Now it sounds correct, right? So yes, this is high time. And why is it a high time? Let's consider. So this is diabetes, the hyperglycemia. And this is poor, innocent person. When we are talking of first-line therapy, the house will be with me on this page that we are only talking about treatment naive patients, right? We are talking about people recently diagnosed of diabetes coming to us, any one of us, for the very first time. Correct? So far we are on the same page. So this is diabetes, a very poor innocent patient, treatment naive, coming to you with hyperglycemia. Coming to Dr. Manohar. Dr. Manohar has a very cool approach. No details needed, no anthropometry needed, age, gender, BMI, duration, diabetes, comorbidities, HbA1c, RBC, OTPT, creatinine, nothing. Kuch nahi chahiye. Because the treatment remains same. First, metformin 500 milligrams BD for 3 months, then 1 gram for 3 months, then 2 grams for 3 months. Finally, by the year end, when the maximum dose of metformin has been given, either the patient will move on or diabetes will move on. Because it's a progressive disease, something has to move on. So no brain work, right? Dr. Manohar has not done any brain work for one year. So cool. Now, same patients attend my OPD. I think let's individualize the treatment. Let's individualize the patients. So we need some brainstorming. We need some lab work to begin with. We need some anthropometry. We need to consider which should be the first drug or which should be the first combination of drugs. It cannot be always metformin and it cannot be only metformin. So ADA guideline 21, maybe metformin along with LSM, ADA guideline 22, move ahead. Consider the comorbidities, become patient-centric and not glucocentric. So consider molecule or molecules to be given, right, as first-line drugs. Now another guideline which says HbA1c above 7.5, begin with a dual therapy, not with a monotherapy. And if you are considering monotherapy, then not always metformin. It can be anything else as well, depending upon the comorbidities, depending upon the patient profile. So let's consider. Any one of you can just stop me and object me at any point of time if you feel I'm wrong. So this is Mr. Jessen. He is 47 years old, newly diagnosed diabetes, family history of diabetes, HbA1c 8.7. Would you like to send him home just on metformin as a monotherapy? Yes or no? No. So why we don't want this? Because we know our target for a young male, no existing comorbidity is somewhere below 6.5. And we also know that even 1% HbA1c reduction will give me a significant benefit. And we also know that we have an early legacy effect. We need to have a good metabolic memory. So we hit hard and hit early, right? I'm running because my time is running. We consider A1C, we consider the risk of hypos, we consider the weight gain, we consider the comorbidities, and we also consider the pocket of the patient, right? So these are the things that we consider. So for this gentleman, probably I would like to go for a triple drug combination to begin with at 8.7. That may be a metformin along with a DPP-4 and SGLT2I. Okay, let's consider Mrs. Carl, 
अगेन अ न्यूली डायग्नोज्ड डायबिटिक बट विथ हैविंग अ सी के डी तो शी इज हैविंग सी के डी एंड नाउ नोइंग दैट शी इज हैविंग डायबिटीज मे बी इट वॉज हाइपर टेंसिव नेफ्रोपैथी मे बी बट नाउ शी इज हैविंग अ रेस्ट क्रियाटन एंड लो जी एफ आर ऑफ फोर्टी फोर वुड यू लाइक टू बिगिन एज मोनोथेरेपी मेटफॉर्मिन येस और नो नो Okay, so these are the guidelines when you follow your creatinine values to decide your OHAs, and you find that metformin stops somewhere around sixty or maybe forty-five. Now we come to the next patient. He is having seven. He's a gentleman of seventy-one years with a history of APD and a history of CVD, with a BMI of only twenty-one, HbA1c seven point nine. You think you would prefer giving metformin as the monotherapy? Yes or no? No. Preferably a DPP four with SGLT two I because this is CVD. Okay. What about this patient, Stephen? Now this gentleman is fifty one year old with having a BMI of around twenty six, HB one C seven point five, but he is having CLD. He has been happily joyfully drinking, so the liver is not supporting him. Again, you think you would like to give metformin as the monotherapy? Yes or no? No. We will consider the liver functions, and if it is NYHA class three or four, definitely metformin is not the drug of choice as the monotherapy. Okay. This George is sixty-three years old with a BMI of eighty-three. Now, HB one C seven point eight. You think we can just send him home with a monotherapy of metformin? Yes or no? I don't think so. now a patient coming to you with chf bmi except uh, decently high 27 hba1c 6.7 you would choose monotherapy as metformin or preferably sglt2i sglt2i okay now this lady andrea she is happily planning her wedding she wants to lose weight because of her wedding just upcoming would you choose glp1 ra or monotherapy metformin answer please glp1 ra so we do have guidelines where you can just fill the details of the patient his or her profile and you can get the suggested molecule or even the combination of molecules so what is important to consider that hba1c levels the bmi levels the risk of hypoglycemia and the patient's affordability along with that the drugs the side effects and the added benefits of the molecule if the molecule is having an added advantage in the chf profile or ckd profile or maybe the weight loss profile so you have added benefits of individual molecules at the same time you also have side effects of individual molecules so each molecule has been designed with some specific added advantages which can be of use to my patient so there are guidelines but these guidelines as the r very whatsapp group started in the beginning said these guidelines are just guidelines you have to individualize you don't have they are not laws to abide by they are guidelines to help us not as a dictum or a, as a dictatorship right so we can just accept that so my take away would be always consider that your target is hba1c reduction along with weight reduction or at least no weight gain with avoiding hypoglycemias individualize the treatment timely initiation intensification and optimization along with affordability that is the criteria of choosing your first molecule or first molecules progressive disease i can see my last minute we just reminding you it's a progressive disease so monotherapies might not be very helpful so today's objectives are again timely initiation intensification optimization considering hba1c targets weight loss avoiding hypos and considering the cost so i think the fight is not for the first position no the fight is for the target hba1c with the be maximum benefit that can be translated to the patient so all the molecules must help each other to achieve that target of hba1c and a good glycemic control so it's going to be a team work it is not going to be a monotherapy and it is not the monopoly of one molecule it is a team work in diabetes management i think it's high time that metformin 
tries to accommodate more than one molecule on the first position, be it DPP4, be it SGLT2I, and of course we have many new now. So nothing will change, don't worry, just see it differently. Thank you. Yeah, so a huge round of applause to Dr. Minel for putting up her case in a very vehement manner. For a minute I was just thinking, were, was Minel practicing in some part of UK or US where she did not have any Indian names in it, but nevertheless. Let's welcome Dr. Manohar to come over and see if he has got his viewpoints on why metformin should probably be the first drug to use in the Indian context of patients. Over to you, Dr. Manohar. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, should we move beyond metformin as first-line therapy? She had only exclamatory remark. I had few question marks also. Is it pre-diabetes, gestational diabetes, diabetes in a certain subset? It is not mentioned. So, Mina lost it there. She beautifully got confused between monotherapy versus first-line therapy. Both are slightly different. Thirdly, wonderfully, she showed all those cases which favors her. Diabetes is not CVD equivalent type 2 diabetes, which we have learned. Not everyone sitting in front of you is having CVD or CKD or, of course, there are these compelling indications, use it. So, no disclosures, nobody will sponsor a metformin talk. Nowadays, they are not sponsoring even SJT2 and DPP4 once the patency has gone. And I told Manoj Bhai, I will not debate. But he said, no, you have to debate. So, I told TK, we will debate it. And this, I think the chair had already put it up that how many are with me. Most prescribed drug, most cost-effective molecule, essential list of medications used in PCOD, pregnancy, cardiac, renal and hepatic dysfunction to one extent. It's not completely out. It makes its way out and it comes back. Heart failure don't use, kidney failure don't use. She showed an easier for a 44, but if it is 30, even SGLT2 inhibitors, we should start thinking. But emerging data, even after so many years of this beautiful drug, emerging data in reducing risk of cancers, aging, don't discount. It's a neighbor's envy, owner's pride. Uh, and it is, it is a hot debate molecule and most of the leading journals talk about it. And this is one study which was done by Taiwanese uh, study, MR-based study, one, for one year follow-up, where they said, yes, SGLT2 reduces heart failure, ACS and mortality, but increases ischemic strokes. We should keep that in mind. It's, it's in a, still in early days if you compare it to metformin. I don't think this August audience need this to be told. And uh, 2002, most prescribed drug in 2005, IDF publishes first-line treatment. We waited for a long time and time-tested old wine is the greatest wine we could ever have. So that's where it is. And even before the CV outcome trials were pushed, UK PDS had already shown that people with metformin had benefits with respect to mortality and morbidity and all cause death, especially with that of stroke and peripheral vascular disease where SGLT2 inhibitors possibly are, uh, are not favorable there. So, and newer insights, again, uh, gut microbiome is coming into the play and GLP-1 and AMPK, we know it. So it, is, it works even there where some of the molecules may not have uh, any effect there uh, directly. So it is a multifaceted multitasker. Hepatic glucose output, fatty acid oxidation, we all know this and gut microbiota, I have to re-emphasize that and also some amount of GLP-1-like effect. Guidelines, everyone recommends it, even today, but they say when there is compelling indication, you can think of using the other drugs. So we can keep that. It's still, if you look at it, and guidelines can't be, uh, uh, you can individualize the treatment, but guidelines should be generalized. Out of 100 patients, we don't see as many as we imagine the ACVD or CKIs. Rest of the garden variety of patients who are ma many still need this. Don't discount uh, this drug so easily. It's still the frontline troop in the war against diabetes. ADA standard of care 2023 also says in heart failure also, if the EGFR is high, we can still use it, just not completely out. And of course, GDM and pre-diabetes, madam totally left it because the heading didn't say it's only type 2 diabetes. So a lot of marks has to be deducted there. So extending care on continuum, that's what, everywhere it can be used. Yes, in certain cases, 
maybe the other drugs are better, but it's not that we can't use it. Pre-diabetes, that's what, where she totally left it. A lot of data, including the ICMR and ADA 2022 says, clearly metformin alone was even more beneficial with, as compared to lifestyle plus metformin. So it is there to be used there. And IDPP, definitely very good study, where it showed that it reduced the risk by 25% to progress into diabetes. And the number needed to treat as compared to the previous studies was much lesser. And even the dose what has to be given was much lesser. Pre-diabetes, so that makes it to be first drug to be approved in the use and the treatment of pre-diabetes also. Newly diagnosed diabetes, why not? If there is a garden variety of patients who are sitting, every 10 new diabetics you see, how many of them really have the renal or, or ACVD parameters coming into the play? Still 50 plus percent would be garden variety. In that, why do you want to deny them the good old cost-effective drug? And as I said that, more than 30 GFR, it has come back. We were, we were paranoid about lactic acidosis and so on, but not now. Cardiovascular benefits, even from the UK PDS study, randomized to metformin, people had fewer diabetes-related endpoints and also reduced mortality. CVOT, CVOT, yeah, it is not a, it, it has come up only recently. It's not for the old timers, the, the daddies of the treatment in diabetes like sulfonylurea and metformin. So, but still, if you look at it, there was some evidence to say that it is favorable even in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, metformin treatment is associated with improved outcomes. May not be as robust as SGLT2 inhibitors or something, but definitely it is not to be abandoned. In the elderly group, very important, we are scared to use it sometimes, but neurodegenerative diseases, it has an improvement and the MILE study is coming up to say that even it can delay aging. So metformin slowed the age-related comorbidities development in older men with type 2 diabetes. So if you look at the ways, the benefit, risk-benefit ratio, still metformin is favorable in most of the groups. Yeah, cost, 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 we used to say. Now anyway, many of are out of the uh, price control, but still we are the world's sixth largest economy, but classified still as developing country, and more than 70% of us pay from the pocket. And uh, I know we both are working in the Manipal group, but the, the, we should beyond look beyond that uh, because most patients are not coming to Manipal or the five-star hospitals where we work. Even today, if I took the cost from the same company. Still, it is more than three times the cost if you look at using the other drugs as a first-line monotherapy also. So, and then go to generics. We always talk about when the MNC is around, generics, efficacy and safety, is it the same as, as, that of met, uh, as that of the originator? So metformin should remain the foundation therapy for most patients. If there is a compelling indication, yes, we should not confuse. I and Meenal had a friendly chat that we are not going to go gaga over our molecule. There is compelling indications, but out of 10 patients, still we see 5-6 patients who require metformin, and in them we should not hesitate to use metformin. And again, SGLT2 talks about non-diabetic uh, groups of people where we get data. Yeah, look at metformin. Even friality in obese, pre-diabetes and, and ACVD, pre targeting aging and microvascular function in pre-diabetes. All these factors also being considered by the learned people and they're doing trials even in non-diabetics in this setup. It's not only that SGLT2 inhibitors who are new or getting uh, good marks in not even treating in diabetes. From influenza treatment to diabetes management nowadays, it's altering infl uh, inflammation, improving longevity, decreased risk of breast, colon, pancreatic, prostate, endometrial and lung cancer. You can't discount this point also. Improves cognitive function, depression and possibly has anti-aging potential. Studies are ongoing. It's not just a hypothesis. The people are looking at it more seriously in those four, five trials what I pointed. CVOT, CVOT we say, but benefits remain uncertain for drug-naive patients. CVOTs were done in people who already had established diabetes. Most of them already had metformin. This is the most important point. Does the background metformin therapy could have contributed to their success? 
again, the opinion is skewed. I'm not going to say it definitely contributed. In some trials like Harmony, they said, yeah, metformin background therapy, they came outcomes were better, but in some were plus minus. But still, there is, you can't take away that part of background metformin therapy, even though there is some skewed data with that. And benefits at PCOD, pregnancy, pre-diabetes, which Madam forgot to mention at all, should be kept. A known devil is possibly better than an unknown angel. Issues with neuroiditis, I, I don't think I will tell you about it. Pregnancy and pre-diabetes, still the uh, data is not so great. So, and I'm ready for the rebuttal and I rest my case. Out of 100 cases, we say, Six to seven will require metformin, definitely. There is benefits beyond just glycemia. Even in non-diabetics, there are data. Don't forget pre-diabetes, GDM, and aging people. Yes, that deserves a good round of applause. So uh, now uh, I would welcome uh, Minal to come on to the stage for a two-minute rebuttal. and. Uh, uh, Manohar will stay on the stage and following which there will be a follow-up rebuttal by him. Uh, but I'm sure the audience would appreciate uh, on how intelligently both the speakers have put forward their viewpoints on the topic as such and how they have intelligently managed to change the uh, audience perceptive. Now let's wait for the rebuttal from uh, Minal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manohar. The the idea of a debate in any conference is not to leave you more confused than what you were already, right? The debate or the topic of discussion was not how good is metformin or how bad is metformin. No. We all know the rules and the regulations. We all know the roles of metformin beyond diabetes, in PCOS, in obesity, as uh, insulin sensitizers, as many more roles as... Uh, anti-aging or cognition improvement. So we are not discussing metformin. We are discussing the algorithm for the management of diabetes and how to place metformin. And Dr. Manohar and myself, we are in the, on the same page with consensus that metformin does occupy a very significant position. But no more that as the first position. We can always consider another molecule. We have options with us as another molecule. We can consider SGLT2I, DPP4, even sulfonylureas for that matter, or thiazolidine dions, or now we have newer molecules also, if the case requires. Right? If the patient is not tolerating metformin, there is no hard and fast rule. There is no compulsion that go on taking metformin even if you are not tolerating it. So we do have options even to replace metformin as a monotherapy. Another thing, metformin no more enjoys the only position. We always consider a dual therapy. So metformin has to share its first position with another molecule. It can be DPP4, it can be SGLT2I, it can even be a triple drug FDC for that matter. So metformin is there to stay, it will stay, but not as the sole position holder. It can be a share position holder, or it can even be a second positioner or a third positioner. That depends upon your individualization and your wisdom. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Manohar. So now over to Manohar for so, the rebuttal. So that's what we agreed upon. What I'm trying, we are trying to say is out of 10 patients still, most of them, current guidelines which may still change it, 6 to 7 may still require metformin. Don't discount the history of it, old is gold, time tested, and so many other gut microbiota, degenerative, aging, so many things are coming up with it. But if there is a compelling indication, there's no reason why we should stick only to metformin. We can, we all know this. Uh, I think if it can be played there, one size does not fit all and uh, uh, equality versus equity. So not everyone can be put on the same drug and not everyone can be there. So finally, this is what I want to say. Drugs are most often than not complementary, not, not very competitive all the time. 